Hi, welcome to your virtual tour of uh, the Girl in the Diary at Jewish Museum Milwaukee. We're really excited to take you through this very interesting exhibit. This diary, uh, this center of this exhibit, was found in the rubble of Auschwitz in 1945. I'll get to that part of the story later, but right now, the thing that you have to understand in reading this diary is it gives you a window into the world of the, of the Lodge Ghetto, as written about by a young girl, Rivka Lipschitz, from 1943 to 1944. Over those six months, she documents her life in the ghetto and the experiences there. Lodz was a city of about 700,000 before World War II, and about a third of the population was Jewish. When the Nazis occupied uh, Lodz, within several months, they started putting all of the Jewish residents in a ghetto. This is the area of the Lodz ghetto right here. It's about 1.5 square miles, and in it, at the height of its, of, of its uh, population, over 200,000 people lived there. Um, the ghetto was run as a large factory, and one of the reasons why it was the longest running ghetto was because it was so productive, that it was the center part of Nazi productivity. And there were all sorts of different things being created and made in this, in this area. Rivka was her, in a sewing factory, and that was her primary responsibility. The ghetto was administered by a guy named Chaim Romkowski, and Romkowski was Jewish, and was in this terrible position of having to appease the Nazis and figure out how to deal with their requests. And in most cases, he thought by keeping uh, this ghetto as very productive as this incredible factory, that he was going to be able to he was going to be able to keep people alive for longer. Many times, though, he lost uh, track of the humanity of the people in the ghetto. For instance, in 1942, he allowed. Rivka's brother and sister to be deported. So when you start reading the words of this diary, you are learning about a young girl who at the age of 14 is writing, and at this point she's already lost her mother and father and two of her siblings. And she's figuring out what she can do and how she can, how she can cope and how she can respond to all of this trauma. These postcards show the gates of the Lodge Ghetto. And these are postcards, which is a strange thing to consider, that someone has chosen to take this and send this to other people to show what's going on. Could it be a way of showing how efficient the Nazi operation is going? A way of showing maybe how well people are treated? We don't know what the actual method is or why they would have these postcards available, but this is one way of getting a sense of life in the world together. This is a reproduction of Rifkin's diary. And in it, you can see just how desperate she was to write down everything that was happening. She's got the entire page covered from margin to margin, from the very top to the very bottom, up to the center line. And in it, she's just tracking her daily lives. Rivka stopped being educated at the age of about 10. And four years later, she's still trying to educate herself um, in an informal way. And so I think one of the things you really see is her working out her thoughts. There's so many parentheticals in there. There's so many dot, dot, dots, because she doesn't know exactly how to say what she wants to say. This room is really a meditative space in order to consider Rivka's words and her family's experience. On the table before you, you see the actual image of her diary uh, in black and white in relief. And then you see translation. There's also some interpretation that was done by a team of scholars, all women, dedicated to telling Rifka's story. Um, one of my favorite pieces to read is this one. Yesterday, I was lost in my thoughts for a while. I was thinking that a 14-year-old girl can be regarded as a child if we take age into consideration. My friends are the best evidence. But to tell you the truth, the ghetto affects them. It affects me too and clearly it doesn't do us any good. Unfortunately, people only take age into consideration and not brains. They consider me, a 14-year-old, to be a child, but they are wrong, I'm going to waste. And I think that this is really that kind of universal feeling that so many of us have when we're in that age of 12, 13, 14, 
where we just feel like people don't understand us, they don't get us, and they think of us as a child. Rivka, even in this terrible scenario, is thinking about that sense of people don't get me, they don't understand what I've been through. The pieces that you see here were all uh, on loan from various Holocaust institutions, one from Warsaw and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And they reflect life in the Lodge ghetto and they reflect uh, the experience of going to Helmno. These pieces right here really show how this was a closed society. There's a coin that was actually forged for living in the ghetto. There was its own currency in that space. And these pieces right here, the spoon and the fork, they are from a killing site called Helmno. Rifka's siblings, when they were deported, were sent to this killing site and killed. These pieces were excavated in the 1980s from an archeological dig. And I think show you, people thought they were going someplace and they were going to live. You don't take a fork with you if you think that you're going to die in this space. This is what you take if you're going to build a life for yourself somewhere. She is so remorseful about this. She writes, I'm full of remorse. Maybe if Abramic had looked well, they wouldn't have taken him. He was such a good kid. How many times when I was short of bread would he give me his? Oh, how many times? That's why he looked bad. I'm full of remorse. And I think this really is such a hard thing to hear because Rivka is in these ter this terrible situation. She has no control of the situation. And yet she still is taking personal responsibility for something she couldn't possibly have control over. There's also this sense of Rivka's diary of her sense of faith. Her belief in God was very central to her sense of survival. She writes that, uh, oh pain, but I'm glad I can feel that it hurts because as long as it hurts, I'm a human being, I can feel. Otherwise it would be very bad. God, thank you for your kindness towards us. Thank you, God. And for her as a Orthodox Jewish girl, this is a way of really sharing that story, of being able to think about that. And it's one of the things that makes this diary unique is that it is the perspective of a young Orthodox woman and how she was seeing this terrible situation. As we look at the rest of this room around the walls, there are photographs that come from the Lodge Ghetto. All of these were designed to make us feel as though we are there with Rivka on some level. But also one of the big challenges of rep representing this exhibit is there are no photographs that exist of Rivka Lipschitz. And so this is a way for us to get a sense of who maybe she was. Maybe she's one of these people in these photographs. Many of the photographs, especially the ones that look damaged, were taken by uh, photo uh, photo Jewish photographers who were tasked with taking uh, pictures of the productivity of the ghetto. And then they, on their own, in secret, would take pictures of the destruction and life in the ghetto. The pictures in color were taken by a Nazi officer who really just wanted to document what was going on from a kind of PR level, and also to give a sense of just how the Nazi operation was working. And for us, this is a small way of getting that kind of picture into life in this horrific place. Rivka's diary was found in the, cre in the rubble of the crematoria in Auschwitz in 1945. So now we have to wonder, how did it get there? Rivka and her sister and her cousins were deported from the Lodge Ghetto to Auschwitz in August of 1944. She stops writing the diary in April of 1944. It's one of the many mysteries that abounds in this story. We don't know why she started writing the diary, and we have no idea why she stopped writing the diary. But when she left the ghetto, it was important enough for her to take it with her. When they were separating people from their possessions, this diary was put in an area of all of the possessions of people that were coming into the into Auschwitz. And at some point, one of the people who was in charge of that sorting took one of the pieces, took this document, and they put it in the uh, near the crematoria. This was part of a larger process. The Sunder Commando, the men tasked with taking people from the gas chamber to the crematoria, had made a process of documenting what was happening to them. 
and they would also take manuscripts from people who were coming in, and they would put them outside the crematoria with the hopes that someday these stories would be found, that someday their story would be told. Rivka's diary is one of nine manuscripts that were found outside of the, the crematoria in Auschwitz. It's a really unbelievable part of this. And they were found by a lady named Zenaida Zinai, Berezovskaya, a Russian doctor. And she was part of the liberation force at Auschwitz. And she writes, this is a, um, a newspaper, a Russian newspaper, from the time in which Auschwitz is liberated. And she says here in Cyrillic, I found the diary here. This is the crematoria in, 19, in June 1945. She saves this diary for the next uh, 50 years, basically. Until 1992, she keeps it with her. At the time of her death, it's given to her son. Her son lives to 1995, and then it goes to his daughter. His daughter, Anastasia, was in America, and she brings it back with her and starts the long process of trying to find somebody to translate it. So in 2008, she finally finds someone that she trusts to do, to do this. And they began this process of translating and then annotating the work. And through that process, they are able to identify Rivka Lipschitz. And then they start coming up with information about her. For instance, this is her registration card for the Lodz Ghetto. And now we know her mother's maiden name and her father's name and her birth date and all sorts of other information. This is an adoption form for Rivka Lipschitz by her aunt after her mother died. We know that this aunt died soon thereafter and her cousins became her guardians. But this was yet another way that showing kind of that life and process in the Lodz ghetto, how things were documented, how they were accounted for. The next document they found took them to Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Yad Vashem is the major Holocaust museum there. And they started a process in the 1950s of trying to account for every person who died in the Holocaust. They wanted to have a name and a page of testimony for them. And in this time period, they have gotten 3.5 million pages of testimony. On the flip side, there are at least 2.5 million people who aren't represented. So Rivka is represented in this group. One of her cousins submitted a page in the 1950s and again later on in life as well. And they say Rivka, she was born in 1929 and in 1945 she died in Bergen-Belsen. This cousin tells that after they were in Auschwitz for a bit, they were transferred as the healthier girls to a work camp, Christian stat. And from then they ended up in another work camp until they end up on a death march to Bergen-Belsen. And at the end of the war, they're all quite sick in Bergen-Belsen. And Rivka's cousins, Mina and Esther, are told, you, your cousin and your sister are going to die. Rivka and their sister are going to die. You are healthy enough to be transferred to a hospital in Sweden. Say your last respects to your, to your family and to go. And they did. So their assumption is Rivka Lipschitz died in 1945 in Bergen-Belsen right after liberation. But the researchers had put out all sorts of requests all over the world. And one of the things that came back from Bergen-Belsen's archives was Rivka Lipschitz's uh, identification on the names of people who were liberated, Rivka Lipschitz, and also on displaced persons records. So you can see that she's saying, she's in this record, she's saying that she's wanting to go to Palestine. Again, her mother's maiden name the same as her registration card are identified. And it's giving the sense of her after the war girl with hopes, a girl who still has a sense that her life is going to be lived. They found her name on one more document. This piece of paper right here. This is a hospital transfer to a hospital in Niendorf, Germany. You can see Rifka Lipschitz. The number here, 4454, is the same one that's on her displaced persons card. Now this hospital in Niendorf had a lot of people who were very ill, and several of the people there died. But they have death records and they have burial records in Meendorf. Rivka Lipschitz isn't on that record. Many of the people survived and actually ended up going other places in displaced persons camps and later immigration. She's not on those lists either. So when we think about what happened to Rivka, the real answer is we don't know. She didn't necessarily die in Meendorf, she didn't necessarily survive. But for us, being able to tell this story, being able to share her words, and being able to explore her family's story in Lodz and beyond 
gives us a way of bringing her memory back to life, gives us a way of understanding who she was and a way of building that story.